You are listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My co-host today is Michelle Jewell Shaw, teacher, mom, photographer, and chairperson of Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Jeremy, and hello to all of our listeners out there. This is episode 100 of Lighthearted, slated for January 25th, 2021. Actually, this is the 110th episode, if you include all the special episodes that weren't numbered. But just the same, we're going to have a special episode celebrating 100 episodes. That one will be lots of fun and surprises. will be released two days from now on Wednesday, January 27th. In Lighthouse history on this date, on January 25th, 2005, Connie Small died at the age of 103. Her husband, Elson Small, was a lighthouse keeper for 28 years, and Connie wrote the book, The Lighthouse Keeper's Wife, when she was 85. Elson Small retired as the last keeper at Portsmouth Harbor Light in 1948. When Connie was 101, she was named the Honorary Chairperson of Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses. Yeah, I was uh, very lucky to have known Connie. I feel very lucky about that. Uh, I interviewed her when she was 96, and I'd like to play a little excerpt from that interview now. When Elson and Connie Small went to Portsmouth Harbor Light Station in 1946, it was the first time they had electricity after 26 years of living on islands off the main coast. They were looking forward to having electricity after so many years of operating uh, kerosene lamps in the lighthouses. But uh, when they moved to Portsmouth Harbor, it was also kind of a letdown. So let me play this little clip of Connie back in 1997. We always look forward to electricity, of course, and the first electricity was when we came to Portsmouth Harbor. Mm -hmm. And of course, he said, well, we go up and light to get the light. So we went up and finally he said, press the button, and I pressed the <laughs> button, and I had no, no more feeling and I've got to vote it right now. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what has happened? What is the reason? Mm -hmm. So I went down to the kitchen, sat down, began to think about it. What in the world, why wasn't I, when we look forward to it as a big thing? Then I realized we had to give 20 minutes of ourselves to light that light. Mm -hmm. And we had put part of us into it. And that made it something. But just to press a button, that was nothing. <laughs> you see what I mean? And so that's my first, but when I went back and went into the house and saw what I could do, we went on an electric binge and <laughs> bought everything we could electric. Also, on January 27th, 1948, the Russian ballet dancer Mikhail Baryshnikov was born. He once said, and I quote, I do not try to dance better than anyone else. I only try to dance better than myself. Well, I can't dance at all, so I don't have to worry about that. In today's episode of Lighthearted, we'll be talking with Elizabeth Spires, who is an award-winning author and poet. Today, we're going to be talking about her new children's book, Kate's Light. Michelle, please help me tell our listeners about Elizabeth Spires and her new book. Sure, Jeremy. Elizabeth Spires was born in Lancaster, Ohio, and she now lives in Baltimore, Maryland. She has always admired the poetry of Emily Dickinson, and by the time she was 12, she had decided to be a writer. When she was in college at Vassar, she began writing poetry seriously. That led to the publication of four collections of poetry for adults. Elizabeth has written seven children's books, including The Mouse of Amherst, The Big Meow, and I Heard God Talking to Me. Her work has won many awards. Among others, she's been the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, two fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Maryland Author Award from the Maryland Library Association. I Heard God Talking to Me was named a School Library Journal Best Book of the Year. Elizabeth Spire's new children's book, Kate's Light, tells the true story of Kate Walker, the renowned keeper of Robins Reef Lighthouse in New York Harbor. The book Kate's Light is illustrated by Emily Arnold McCulley, a Caldecott Medal winner. Kirkus Reviews said this about Kate's light, quote, Kate comes alive through the combined talents of Spires and McCulley, and their portrayal highlights how an ordinary woman can excel and pave the way for others by virtue of her dedication and fortitude, unquote. I had an opportunity to speak with Elizabeth Spires recently. Let's listen to that conversation now. 
I am with Elizabeth Spires today, who is an award-winning children's book author and poet uh, living in Baltimore. Hi, Elizabeth, and Happy New Year. Hi, Jeremy. It's good to be on the podcast. We're going to get into Kate Walker, of course, the subject of your, your book. But I just want to talk a little bit about your background first. And you are, of course, a poet, along with uh, writing children's books. And um, I'm just wondering, do you find any similarities in the writing of poetry and the writing of children's books? I think, actually, I, I've been pondering that because other people sometimes ask me that question. I think they're pretty different from each other, but I think they have one thing in common, whether you're writing a poem or whether you're writing, especially if you're writing a picture book for children, you have to be extremely economical and you really have to pare down your text. You know, no word can be wasted. But, you know, when I'm writing for children or a younger audience, it's often when I feel more playful. And a lot of times you want to entertain a young audience. You don't want to be so heavy. I like stories for children that I'm going to do that are that are hopeful or have some sort of hope in them. And poems, when I'm writing for adults, sometimes they're more serious. They might be darker. I've got to say, though, that there are darker, tragic moments in Kate Walker's story. I don't, I don't focus on them, but, you know, she was widowed when she was a young woman in Germany, and then John Walker, her second husband, died five years after they were married. So, I mean, there's adversity in her story, but there's also a lot of hope. Oh, absolutely. And uh, what you said about uh, the similarity between uh, children's books and poetry is kind of what I was thinking. That's just the economy of the language that are similar in a way. I had to um, excise one or two scenes in the book. There just wasn't room. (laughs) You know, a picture book only can be so many pages. So I had to get rid of some things. I have your your beautiful book, uh, Kate's Light, right here next to me. Uh, It's already been explained in the uh, introduction, but I just want to mention again that it is, of course, the story of Kate Walker, the very famous, uh, renowned keeper at Robin's Reef Lighthouse in New York Harbor. Her story is is pretty amazing and uh, I think pretty well known to many uh, lighthouse aficionados. But let me ask you, uh, what led you to write a book on Kate Walker? Actually, it was a, it's a little odd because I was just simply reading an article about New York Harbor, and I can't even at this point, it was a few years ago, tell you what when it was. There was just a little aside in this article, a brief mention of this woman, Kate Walker, who'd lived at Robins Reef Lighthouse for 33 years, and most of that time alone. And that just little nugget of information, just it just made me really curious to find out more about her. It seemed like such a long time to live in this lighthouse. So I, I did some research, and one day I took the Staten Island Ferry from um, Battery Park to Staten Island, and I looked for Robins Reef. And you can see it from the Staten Island Ferry. It's extremely tiny. You really should have binoculars with you. That's happened to me before, whether it's a poem for adults or children's book, where just some little mention or some little image leads me on this kind of trail to find out more. Yeah, I've uh, seen the lighthouse from the Staten Island Ferry, and uh, like you say, it's it's pretty distant, but I was able to zoom on it pretty well and get some decent photos. But that's that's as close as I've, as I've gotten, probably as close as uh, a lot of people have gotten who've uh, photographed it. But let me ask you a two-part question. Were you interested in lighthouses before you started this project? And second part of that question is, if you were not, do you consider yourself a lighthouse aficionado now? Uh, I think I, I have always loved lighthouses. I, Growing up, I didn't get to see any because I grew up in Ohio. But as soon as I moved to the East Coast, I did get, over the years, get to see lighthouses in all, all over the place. I mean, some are in Maine, some are in Maryland on the Chesapeake Bay, and some in Florida and North and South Carolina. I don't think I've ever ran into anyone who would say, I don't like lighthouses. I mean, unless they flash into their bedroom window every night or something. 
I like everything about them. I like the way each one's unique, and I like the way they're all painted differently and how they have a kind of signature flash. And I've always wanted to imagine life lived in a lighthouse, what that's like. But it wasn't until I kind of came to Kate's story that I really, you know, got started on a writing project. Kate Walker is is quite well known, as I mentioned, and uh, she and other women keepers, especially I would say Ida Lewis in Newport, Rhode Island, they got some attention in their lifetimes, and I think a, a lot of lighthouse buffs or aficionados are certainly aware of them today. But the general population, I think, has has never heard of Kate Walker outside of lighthouse buffs. Why do you feel her story should be remembered? What what's so compelling about uh, Kate Walker? Well, you're right. She's not like a famous person or some sort of, she's a lighthouse celebrity, but she's not a celebrity. I guess that what appeals to me is this quiet, unsung life, just lived doing this job day in and day out. I mean, of course, a job keeping a lighthouse is a little unusual. It's not like a regular type job. And I just admire that kind of strength and steadiness to her and she loved the job I mean this wasn't as if it was thrust upon her and she had to do it but wish she was doing something else she that's where she wanted to spend her life and be and it's just a different kind of it it's just shining the light on some kind of life really different from most people's and the kids wouldn't necessarily have It's showing them something about the past that they know nothing about. And I think it's really important for some books for kids to be about the past and not just be about the present or imagine the future. You know, I guess I'm drawn to the past. When you were talking about how she pretty much liked life at the lighthouse, although it was obviously really hard work, I was thinking about uh, reading someplace that she, when she would go into New York City, she hated it. It was probably terrifying for her to see so many people and cars and everything else, and she said she preferred it at the lighthouse. I think that might be true, but um, one of the things I noticed when I would be reading magazine and newspaper articles that were contemporaneous, you know, that were features on Kate, sometimes I wondered if they were inventing things or exaggerating things. I mean, I am not saying she liked being in New York City at all, but... It was always like trying to decide, would she have actually felt that way or not? But I, obviously, she had to enjoy and enjoy this kind of isolated life because she could have made a different life for herself, you know. If you start reading old magazine and newspaper articles, you find out that the reporters get things wrong sometimes. <laughs> Fake news. <laughs> No, there's there's no doubt about that. I've been you know researching lighthouses for a long time, and you can't you can't trust a single source. And a lot of times you'll if there was an event, you'll find one newspaper article describing it, and you find another one that describes it in a totally different way. So you have to try to use some judgment to mesh the different accounts. I tried to make a timeline, and at times I would see that the accounts were contradicting each other. To change the subject a little bit, I uh, have read that you have a long fascination with the poet, Emily Dickinson, and your book, your children's book, The Mouse of Amherst, is about a mouse that lives in Emily Dickinson's house. I'm wondering if you find any parallels between Emily Dickinson and Kate Walker? Oh, well, I think the biggest parallel is that, in a way, they both live these solitary lives because Dickinson was known to basically stay in the house. Sometimes she kind of crept out into her garden at night, but she really didn't have a lot of social contact with people. Now, Kate was not antisocial because she had good friends on Staten Island, and I know that from the accounts I've read, she enjoyed seeing those friends. But, you know, the nature of her job was that she spent a lot of time alone, so I'm thinking how... Dickinson was channeling her energy into writing poems, and of course, Kate was using her energy to tend Robin's Reef, and they were both very, very strong, focused introverts, I guess you could say. Back to your book, Kate's Light. By the way, I I, I just picked it up and noticed that the copyright is 2021, so it's uh, fresh off the the presses as, as we speak here. 
And mm-hmm. uh, again, it's it's really beautiful. I love the the cover. Uh, the illustrator is uh, Emily Arnold McCulley, and uh, they're watercolor and ink uh, illustrations, and I, I really love them. Uh, why was Ms. McCulley chosen as the illustrator, and what do you think her work adds to the book? I have known Emily Arnold McCulley's work for a long time because she, uh, most people know uh, who read children's books know her book, Murad on the High Wire. It won a Caldecott Award for a Best Illustrated Children's Book of the Year. More recently, um, Macaulay illustrated a children's book called Dare the Wind, and Dare the Wind was about Ellen Prentice, who was a female navigator of a clipper ship, The Flying Cloud, and this was maybe around 1851. And the illustrations were so beautiful in the book about Ellen Prentice you can imagine if it's about a clipper ship, there are all these scenes of water and there are storms. And I was just uh, really taken with the way Macaulay does those water scenes, as well as just her beauty of the pictures, all of her pictures. So I asked my editor at Holiday House if she could see if Macaulay would illustrate this book. And so I was felt, feel really lucky that she did. Isn't it kind of uh, apropos their watercolors, of course? I mean, watercolors are good for water scenes. Right. There are uh, some photos of Kate Walker. Uh, I think I, in my collection I have a newspaper article that has a bunch of pictures of her. But I also saw that the Noble Maritime Collection uh, on, on Staten Island has a lot of photos, a lot more photos. Even on their website they show some of them. I had never seen them before. Did you consult with the Noble Maritime Collection organization when you were working on the book? Well, part of my research took me out there because I knew that they had acquired Robin's Reef. There was some sort of program where the U.S. government would allow certain kinds of organizations to acquire lighthouses that were old and derelict, and, you know, if they would take responsibility and hopefully start to restore them. The Noble Maritime Museum acquired Robin's Reef, and actually Noble Maritime Collection is a better way to refer to it. And I went out, they had a, they, and it's still up as far as I know, they have this incredible exhibit on Kate Walker. It takes up a couple rooms in their building, and it's beautiful archival photographs. It's the timeline. It's excerpts from letters. It's facsimiles of logbooks and letters. And she even, they even have some of Kate's possessions uh, kind of arranged in one little part of one room. That particular exhibit really amplified my in- interest in Kate and understanding of her life because It made me see her more in the context of her family and her friends and not just in terms of her light-keeping duties. And then also uh, the founder of the Noble Maritime Collection, Aaron Urban, uh, wrote a book on Robin's Reef, not just on Kate, but on the lighthouse itself. Of course, I read that book, too. She probably knows as much as anyone about the lighthouse and about Kate. Yeah, I uh, was looking at their website, and they have uh, information and pictures of that exhibit, and it looks really good. Travel right now is a little little difficult, but um, hopefully I hope to get back to Staten Island to see. I haven't been to the National Lighthouse Museum since uh, it opened a couple of years ago, and uh, the Noble Maritime Collection exhibit would be another great thing to check out there. I think that it um, sounds like I'm giving them a plug, and I guess I am, but... The Noble Maritime Collection, I think they're open now. I mean, not every day of the week, but, you know, it, it looks as if one can go there as long, as long as they take the kinds of precautions people are supposed to take when they go to museums now. Yeah, so, but it's getting there. I'm in, I'm in New Hampshire and just, uh, you know, the, I haven't done much traveling in the last few months, and uh, hopefully things will change fairly soon. And, I'm wondering if you found any other good sources of information besides uh, their collection. What other research did you do when you were working on the book? Actually, the research I did predated my visit to the Noble Maritime Collections exhibit. A few years ago, some of these things take a lot longer than you think they would, you know, when when the idea starts to percolate and then as you take it to fruition. 
But um, I spent a summer in New York City, and some days I would go either to the um, New York Historical Society or the New York Public Library, and I would do research. I'd have a date for some article that I knew existed, like from the New York Times or from Harper's. And I would, you know, call it up and they would bring me, sometimes what they would bring me was microfilm because not everything was digitized from record, you know, newspapers and magazines of note. So I would just scroll through microfilm looking for certain articles and and then they can print it for you if you tell them what it is that you've just found. So, yeah, I was doing I was trying to find my sources by do, by my original sources primary sources by being up there doing this research in New York City it, although it's it sounds a little tedious when you actually find something it's really exciting like if you come across a photo or an, of the lighthouse or the interior of the lighthouse or a cave or a family that you'd never seen you know it was, it was like it made it all worth it well, I know exactly what you mean, uh, and I've I've looked a lot, at a lot of microfilm in the last thirty years in, in libraries and historical societies, and I I always kind of enjoyed it in a way, looking for nuggets, you know, little bits of gold in there. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. at the same time, it's pretty amazing that so much stuff has been digitized and is available online, which obviously is is a lot more convenient. But there's still plenty out there that's not digitized, like you said. There is a, there's a lot of detail in the book about lighthouse life. Uh, which is really nice uh, about the technical aspects of lighthouses and the the work of a lighthouse keeper without getting overly complicated, I think, for children. I think you hit a good balance there. So besides researching Kate Walker and Robin's Reef Lighthouse, I imagine you must have done some research on lighthouses in general? Well, yeah. I think when I first started the project, it just all seemed a little vague, like you know, days and nights in a lighthouse and how things worked and how the lenses worked and how they kept them going and, and what they were powered with. And, and it just, it sounds like small details, but I really needed, felt like I wanted to get a grip on that so that I could try to not explain it in detail, but talk about it a little bit so that kids wouldn't just think, oh, they live in a lighthouse and they flip a switch and the light goes on and that's hmm. it or something, you know. So I I tried to, I, you know, I, I did have to learn quite a bit about lighthouses. I mean, I think there's plenty more to learn, but I, I feel like I have a little bit of a grip on it. Yeah, uh, well, there's always more to learn. Uh, one of my favorite illustrations in the book, I just opened up the book here, and uh, looking at page 21, there's a picture of Kate whacking the, the fog bell with a hammer, with a handheld hammer. You know, there's so much that you learn that you cannot put in the book, and one of the things I found when I was looking at the Kate Walker exhibit on Staten Island was that the people of Staten Island wrote a letter complaining about the foghorn, which was kind of funny, and how it was ruining their sleep when the foghorn, you know, would, had to, who would, you know, who would think that one of your duties was if the foghorn fails, that you're up there with the hammer. I mean, I guess you'd be up there all night hitting the bell. Yeah, and potentially longer than a night. As you just said, at Robin's Reef, there was a steam-operated foghorn that operated Mm -hmm. most of the time when visibility was bad, but the bell was a backup. And uh, I can't imagine. (laughs) I mean, sometimes there's fog for for weeks at a time. So she had one or two of her children living with her some of the time when she was there, right? So maybe they they helped. Well, and I mean, for the first few years she was at Robin's Reef, John Walker, her husband, would have been the head light keeper and Kate was the assistant. So they could have spelled each other. But You'd have to be pretty strong to be the keeper of a lighthouse in those days. And the the other thing that's funny that's uh, actually not in the book, but supposedly, according to articles, Kate was 4 foot 10, maybe Mm. weighed 100 pounds. When you look at the pictures, she just looks like a compact, strong woman. But this is not, this isn't a large, tall woman. This thing she could do, you know, row the row the dory and save people who, you know, it was pretty amazing. Absolutely. I was just going to ask you that. I remember that she was short in stature, but I can remember how short, but that's that's pretty short. Ida Lewis, the other, uh, one of the, probably the m- most uh, famous 
woman keeper other than than Kate Walker, uh, I think was also quite short but extremely strong and a great handler of a, a dory and so forth. You mentioned before that the Noble Maritime Collection now owns Robbins Reef Lighthouse. That's the uh, National Historic Lighthouse Preservation Act, under which lighthouses are gradually being transferred to to nonprofit organizations and other entities. And in many cases, like Robbins Reef, uh, the Coast Guard is still maintaining the light itself, but not maintaining anything else. I'm I'm right about that, aren't I? That still it's still an active right. aid to navigation. Yeah. As far as I understand, it's an automated light. Right, um, right. You know, yeah. But the Coast Guard just has to check on it once in a while, but it's it's automated. And uh, the organization, the Noble Maritime Collection, is restoring it. I was reading on their website. Uh, I think it's kind of a gradual restoration. Do you have a, any idea of how that's coming along? I, I don't know what's been happening with it recently or whether um, this particular pandemic year has slowed down whatever they were doing. A while back, I think it was 2012, you know, they had started their restoration efforts and then um, the Superstorm Sandy Mm. just kind of took them back to zero. I mean, the the things they had done to shore up the lighthouse and start working on the inside were, were flooded and destroyed. And it's a lot harder. I wouldn't have understood this if I hadn't done all this research restoring a lighthouse than you would think especially if it's an offshore lighthouse you don't have any power source or mm-hmm. anything and yep. you know you have to keep going you going out there with stuff i think it's really a massive undertaking when you restore i mean you know the lighthouse probably wasn't in that good of shape to begin with because it was closed up in 1966 i can tell you from personal experience that restoring an offshore lighthouse is unbelievably hard work and uh, expensive of course also so were, were you in were you part of a endeavor to uh, restore an offshore lighthouse well I'm I'm uh, president of the American Lighthouse Foundation and I yeah. founded the local chapter the Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses and one of the two lighthouses we take care of is Whaleback which is a granite 70 foot granite tower near uh, in between Portsmouth New Hampshire and Kittery Maine and uh, mm-hmm. You know, just there's no landing place other than wet rocks out there. So just to get volunteers on there or to get any kind of materials out there is just, uh, you know, daunting. You never know if the the weather and sea conditions are going to allow you to get out any particular day. I think that that is the case with Robin's Reef. You mentioned no landing because when Kate and John would go out to the lighthouse, go back and forth from the lighthouse to the mainland, you would just have to climb up a ladder mm-hmm. to get to the to the promontory deck i mean you didn't just step off of the boat onto like ground or a landing or anything so right by the way you mentioned hurricane sandy a few minutes ago and um, i was just going to mention that as you might know old orchard shoal lighthouse in new york harbor was wiped out it was gone after the hurricane oh yeah so uh luckily that didn't happen to to robin's reef so let me ask you a general question here to get back to uh, to the book. What is uh, your hope, or what do you hope that children might take away uh, from it when they read your book? Well, um, besides the fact of just giving them a little glimpse into a really specific type of life, life lived, you know, in a time different than ours, I, I th- okay, here's what drew me to Kate's story. It's not just how long she lived at Robin's Reef. But it how how strong and resilient she was, and she, she lived this such a solitary life. And uh, right now, a lot of us are, I mean, because of the pandemic, we're we're leading more solitary lives than before. But our lives are not solitary the way hers was. I mean, we have all these ways to connect with people, whether it's by you know uh, internet or phone or Zoom, Zoom or yeah. whatever, and She was able to develop these, I guess I'm just going to call them inner resources, you know. And there's a quote from, um, I didn't make it up or anything, there's a quote that she gave to one reporter and that how there were worse things than loneliness and that loneliness had taught her how to be an entertaining companion for herself. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's really important for kids to 
if I mean they that may not be the first thing they take away from reading this book, but I I like to think that they see somebody who realizes that you have to be a kind of entertaining companion for yourself or you're going to be incredibly bored a lot mm-hmm. of the time. Um, and, and so I, I actually think that that story particularly has a little bit more resonance or whatever meaning for right now. How to be strong and self-reliant and solitary. Maybe lonely is the wrong word, but solitary. Yeah. You know? By a friend of mine, uh, Fred Mickelson, is a former lighthouse keeper in Rhode, Rhode Island. Uh, but he was out there in the late 50s at a similar lighthouse, Connecticut Light in Rhode Island, uh, very similar to Robin's Reef. And he always likes to say he, being a lighthouse keeper taught him the difference between loneliness and solitude. He said he mm-hmm. enjoyed the solitude, and uh, I think he rarely felt felt lonely. But you, uh, as you said, you have to be self-sufficient. And in Kate's days at Robin's Reef, it was before radio or TV or, you know, she had uh, basically no modern entertainment out there. So she, like you said, she had to basically make her own fun or, you know, uh, find ways to occupy her time when she wasn't working. Well, one of the things there was room for in this book was a, was a kind of two paid, uh, kind of a factual account at the very end, even though the book is factual. And I did want to point out to kids that, you know, who who aren't quite sure what's life like in 1885 or 1890. You know, I mentioned there weren't there weren't telephones or cell phones or radio or television or movies or internet or email, um, not to mention video games and all that. And you know, I guess the question for, from children might be, what did they do all the time? You know, when they weren't working. And I mean, there was a gramophone, and there was their chest of books called the Traveling Libraries, the Traveling Lighthouse Libraries, where mm. the lighthouse tender would drop off this lighthouse library to the keepers, and they read. And then when they, you know, and then they would get a new chest of books. And I, I love that. But yeah. That's that was their entertainment. Yeah, I'm familiar with those lighthouse library. The wooden it was like a wooden box type thing that had uh, two doors that would uh, open up and uh, put the books inside. And uh, I think there's still a few of those circula- circulating around as uh, antiques. So I was wondering if you have uh, any plans for any other lighthouse-related projects? Not at the moment. I haven't had an idea that just kind of totally is grabbing me at the moment that has to do with lighthouses. Mm-hmm. I Because I live in Baltimore, I am kind of interested in what happens in the Chesapeake Bay, and I'm not saying this would ever be a book, but these there are a lot of islands out there that are disappearing or have disappeared and that Mm -hmm. used to have little villages and houses on them. So sometimes I look at pictures of what used to be and isn't there at all now. But I'm not sure that will ever be something I write about for kids or not. Let me ask you about a, a particular part of the book that I, I really like that is certainly one of the, is, is probably one of the better known incidents in Kate's life that's been in a number of articles. She actually rescued a dog. Well, that. yeah, she was rescuing um, five shipwrecked men and they had, a, I mean, they had a dog and she, the captain of that was part of this rescue of the five that she rescued and he had a dog, and so um, she took them all back to the lighthouse. But when the five men left the lighthouse to go to the mainland, they left the dog with Kate for several weeks, and Kate and the dog became such good friends. But Kate said later, when she was quoted by a reporter, that probably the person or the being that was most grateful of ever having been rescued by her was the dog. And I also thought that, I I thought it was I found a picture of Kate later when she retired to Staten Island, and she got a dog. So Mm. um, that there's a picture of her in a rocking chair with the dog, and not the same dog. I'm saying another dog. So um, I I like the kind of justice of that or the happiness of that. So I have one more question for you for bonus points. Uh, Uh huh. Okay. Uh, What did you enjoy most about writing Kate's Light? Well, okay, two things. The first is probably a little odd. 
I actually really like doing the research. I know that sounds strange because research sounds like not the fun part, but sometimes the research made me feel like I was a detective. And mm. ever since I was little, I I liked the idea of girl detectives. So, uh, so when I would be looking for things on Kate and I would find them, that was really gratifying. But then, uh, this sounds so basic, I just really liked imagining Kate's life. And, you know, if you spend months thinking about something or a person like Kate Walker, it takes you away from your own life and you really start to inhabit their life a little bit. So, I don't know, I felt I felt grateful for that, to think about things from Kate's perspective, which is really different than probably my own. Well, the, I think the fact that you uh, got so deeply into it shows in the book, and that's what part of what makes it so special. So, Elizabeth Spires, I, I really appreciate you spending this time with me today, and I, I just want to say again that the book is beautiful, uh, Kate's Light. Kate Walker at Robin's Reef Lighthouse. And uh, of course, it's available through online booksellers, Amazon and, and others, and probably at some bookstores. I don't know how, how many people are going to bookstores right at the moment, but uh, but it's certain, it's readily available online, and I, I recommend it very highly. So again, Elizabeth, uh, thank you so much. Uh, great talking to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. I really am happy I could talk to you and be part of this podcast. Another good source on the life of Kate Walker is the book Women Who Kept the Lights by J. Candace Clifford and Mary Louise Clifford. That's right. I consider that book a classic. Uh, it has information on many women keepers in the United States. Another excellent recent book on women at lighthouses is Guiding Lights by Shauna Riddell. Thanks to the members, staff, and volunteers at the U.S. Lighthouse Society and all its chapters and affiliates in this country and around the world. Donations and memberships in the U.S. Lighthouse Society support this podcast and all the Society's preservation and education efforts. To learn more, go online to uslhs.org. Thanks and respect to everyone everywhere who's working to preserve lighthouses or any kind of history. We're all on the same team and your work is important. If you listen to this podcast through Apple Podcasts, please rate and review us. And if you use Facebook, check the U.S. Lighthouse Society's page at facebook.com slash USLHS. Anything you can do to let your friends know about this podcast by sharing on social media is greatly appreciated. And I want to mention one more thing. There's a new documentary film called The Last Lightkeepers by filmmaker Rob Apps, who was interviewed on this podcast a few episodes ago. I strongly recommend the film, which is about lighthouse preservation in New England. A portion of the proceeds from the sales of the film go to the preservation of Whaleback Lighthouse in Kittery, Maine. You can buy or rent the film through Amazon. Just go to Amazon.com and search for Last Lightkeepers. It'll be the first thing that you see in the search results. As always, thanks for listening and keep a good light. Out in the dark, I'm gonna let it shine. Out in the dark, I'm gonna let it shine. Out in the dark, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine.